Okay. Uh, okay. And no one's on here, so we're cool. Probably because I'm 11 minutes late. Sweet. But we'll record this. I'm pretty sure it's recording now. That last 11 minutes didn't happen. All right, let's talk about the quiz. There's really only one question that we need to look at, and that's this bottom one. All right, so why, uh, why is that the answer? <clears throat> Yeah. Yeah. So, how do uh, neurons release neurotransmitters? Have you learned that before? What comes to mind when you're thinking neurotransmitter release? Sweet. Synaptic vesicles. We're going to see how this goes. We might make a big mess and just have to do it. We're supposed to write in this, right? Okay. Thank you. Okay, so this is uh, this is how I draw our pin synapses. So vesicles. All right. So they're always there. And Doc, why do they fuse with the membrane? Made of membrane, um, mm -hmm. Yeah. Nice. They don't always fuse, though. We'll cause them to fuse in an activity dependent manner. What? Nice. All right. Calcium is going to flow in. Why does calcium flow in? We will get to all of this, by the way. I just want to kind of jog your memories a little bit. Calcium comes in. Does it just move freely through the membrane? No? Okay, great. What's it move through? Excellent. There's some kind of protein in here, some kind of ion channel, and the channel makes the most sense because they're going to have the fastest rate of ion flux. What do we call those channels? Well, what ions moving through them? Okay, great. So it's a calcium channel. We'll fill in the rest later. So somehow calcium flows through a channel, some kind of calcium channel. Are these always open? These calcium channels? Maybe no. I don't think so. Okay, we're leaning toward no. It's a nice way to lean. Now they're not always open. Why do they open? Excellent. So we still have something to cover in lecture six. That's okay. Now, what if this were a glutamatergic neuron? Would the story have been any different? Is calcium still flowing in? Is calcium what's going to somehow trigger vesicle fusion? Excellent. It doesn't matter what neurotransmitter you're releasing. You got to get calcium into the presynaptic site. That's going to trigger snare complex, tightening, uh, synaptic brevet. It's going to poke into the membrane. I'll open up a hole. We'll get into that in lecture six. But it's all the same proteins. So the different inhibitory neurons aren't going to be characterized by this. It's the same mechanism of release. Calcium comes in, vesicles fused. Doesn't matter if you use GABA, glutamate, semicolene, doesn't matter always the same. So that's not what we use to categorize the different types of GABA or neurons. Everything else is fair game. <clears throat> All right, was there anything in the lecture that you wanted me to review? Yeah, 
unexpected um, what the points are. Repeat that last part. Like, what, like what it affects, what makes it happen, what or what triggers the neuron to leave the lab. Oh, we'll be talking about uh, the mechanisms of neurotransmitter release. That's got its own lecture, and it's the same for all of them, unless we're talking about neuropeptides. It's pretty darn similar, but they're just in a different spot. Um, so that's going to be the same for all of them. You should know that. It doesn't matter what neurotransmitter releasing, you need to know the mechanisms of release. Whenever we get to lecture six, the mechanisms of neurotransmitter release. Um, let's see. <clears throat> um, the synthetic pathways for these will also cover. I think it might be in the same lecture, actually. So the first unit is going to be on the electrical activity of the nervous system. And how that all works. We'll talk about the chemical aspects of it, so the, the neurotransmitters, the different ones, how they're made, um, enzymatic uh, 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 synthesis and degradation of them, the intracellular signaling pathways, so all the the protein protein interactions that we covered later on. The first one is more just about Ohm's law and why that's so darn important. Um, it's probably good to know that. Your neuromodulatory uh, transmitters are all made by very discrete populations of neurons. They're not ubiquitous, like glutamatergic, gabaergic, and glycinergic neurons. So those are all over the nervous system. But your dopaminergic neurons are going to just be found in midbrain. Right? They're, they're only in one spot. We'll review that when it matters. Uh, <laughs> if I don't tell it to you, though, I probably don't want you to know it. I don't think that answered your question. I'm so sorry. No, I think it did. Um, basically, like, don't worry about that. Yeah, so <laughs> exactly. Like, the, the stepwise synthesis of, let's say, dopamine from uh, tyrosine. Yeah. yeah. Don't worry about that yet. But we'll, we'll get to that. Tyrosine hydroxylase, dopamine carboxylase. Two steps. But that's later. Any questions on the uh, uh, material that? That was mentioned in the lecture. I've got one no, two no's, we have a majority. Okay, well, I have a few questions then. And what I would like for you to do is talk to each other. And now that we have a handful, holy shit, a whole handful of people, uh, rather than just three, it's probably a little less awkward to do this. So talk. And then we're going to go through this together. And I'm not going to tell you anything. You're going to tell me everything. Okay, Mingo, would you prefer to attend the I don't know what. I'm on the third one. Maybe. But since there's so few of us. Now, normally I got a lecture hall like this. Actually, you usually have a lecture hall? Yeah. 
47. I'm a liar. Um, this might be easier if we're just, let's all walk through each one and let's do it together. What do you say? Okay. I'm not going to talk, but you all will. I'll maybe try to facilitate, but I hope not. And there's no need to raise your hand. Just take the stage. Okay, so I'll take the easiest part. Um, <laughs> axons send out signals then right to save them. There's usually only one axon, and it can be it can take a lot of different morphologies. Um, that with the dendrites, uh, I think there's four total that I remember, the basic ones. Um, yeah. Okay, so we're sending out a signal. Yep. What might that be? What do we call these signals? Go ahead. Take the signal itself. And what do we call the signals we're sending out? A little chemical. Okay, sure, and that leads to the release of? Great. Both true. We're going to conduct action potentials down the axon. We're going to release neurotransmitters. Does that ever happen in the dendrites? No. It does. Ha <laughs> ha. I tricked you. That's okay, though. That's an exception uh, to this, this rule. We're going to consider the rule, though. You're totally right. I just wanted to, to tell you that's, that's true, except when it's not. Like everything we're going to say in this class is true, except when it's not. So, yes, we'll think of this as the mouthpiece. Conducting action potentials down it and spitting out neurotransmitter along the way at presynaptic sites. We'll think of the dendrites as being receptive, but we're going to appreciate that it works both ways. Have we ever heard of retrograde messengers? Excellent. Can we name one that neurons use? You'll be able to name two at the end of this class. That's pretty good. You guys ever heard of, um, what's that called? Weed? You ever heard of weed? <laughs> no. So, so it's, uh, what do they call it? What is that? The devil, is it the devil's, the devil's the lettuce? Devil's the devil's lettuce, thank you. You've heard of it. Okay. Um, yeah, so that, that is going to act on this retrograde message that passes from dendrites to axons to decrease the probability of neurotransmitter catching the release. And that's why, so I've heard memory is impaired and attention is not quite as good uh, when you partake with the, the, the devil lettuce. But pretty well true. Mouthpiece, earpiece. Sends uh, out neurotransmitter, receives neurotransmitter. And you said something about one versus how many dendrites do we have? We have many. You could have many. What's the least number of dendrites we could have? Yeah, probably one. Depending on how you want to call it, you can call it zero. No true dendrites if you're pseudo unipolar or unipolar. But it's variable, but it's not variable with axons. One's going to come off and it's going to branch, but only one comes off the cell body. Now, how about the, the shape of these things? Um, the shape of like the axon or like the cell morphology? Let's talk about axons and dendrites. And let, let, when I'm talking shape, how about the, the, the diameter of them as you move away from the cell body? So if we get smaller? Or which one? Oh. For, dendrites. Um, for axons, not necessarily because of the way like the synapses, so like they have the button that they can get out across that area. All right, yeah, yeah. Yeah, in the cartoon world, that's totally how it's going to work. Uh, and, and then in real life, they just pass along. But uniform diameter, you're totally right. You're not going to think about tapering with axons. You don't want that. You don't want to increase the internal resistance and impede current flow. You do want to do that with dendrites, though. Dendrites are going to conduct electricity mostly toward the cell body because of that taper. Electricity, like us, is going to take the path of least resistance. So there's a lot of ways that they're different from each other, except when they're not. They can also be pretty darn similar. There's some other differences in how their microtubules are arranged, but I think that's good enough. So let's look at dendrites and axons. All right, we're on to the next one. What are we thinking here? Which one's going to receive input from the greater number of neurons? You think it can be B or D? Gotcha. Dendrites. So this is a large layer five pyramidal neuron. So there's the apical dendrite. 
Branding out there, basal dendrites. Here's D, a layer two, bramble neuron, similar it's morphology. Like the dendrites, so it looks like So don't think about that. Don't think about this as being their connectome. This is just showing you their morphology. Where's their dendrites? Where's their axon? A neuron is going to have uh, hundreds of thousands of synapses. On. Can't show you all those. But which one do you think is going to have the greatest number of synapses? Let's talk about that. Now we're thinking about input. Where do we receive our input? Excellent. So if you're going to receive input, you got to have space for it. You gotta have space for your stuff. So, which one has the most space for input? Which one am I here? B. Yes. Yes, B is in very good. We have a lot more dendrite, so we can receive more inputs. That's the only thing we wanted to get out of that. All right, so we got two, two synapses here. Is this presynaptic or postsynaptic? This green one. Three. How do you know? I just do. I take neuro tests. I don't remember. Exactly. What are you looking for? Um, I was looking for um, just the way it looks. <laughs> Fantastic. <laughs> Sure. And what sort of thing of its look are you are you uh, trying to eye there? Well, it has a nucleus. Um, Not in the axon. So, but but you are right. There is an organelle there, but not the nucleus. Where does the nucleus live? The nucleus lives in the cell line. Very good. Yes. Not in the axon. You don't make proteins in the axon. No nucleus, no, no ribosomes, but we do have this thing. This is a mitochondria. So we have a mitochondrion in there. There's another one over here and here and here. They're all over the place because we need ATP. What do we find at presynaptic sites? When I draw this cartoon, I have to include these things. Thank you, vesicles. Look at the vesicles. Where you see vesicles, that's presynaptic. Notice in this spine, no vesicles. We don't store the neurotransmitters that are released from dendrites in vesicles because we can't. But we do that at presynaptic sites. So that's a dead giveaway that these are the presynaptic sites. One's symmetric, one is asymmetric. Believe it or not, this membrane is a little bit thicker than that one. I can't see it myself, but I can read. If it's asymmetric, what does that mean? Thank you. Excitatory, symmetric, inhibitory. I will not ask you to interpret electron micrographs. They all look like, I don't know, ultrasounds to me. They don't make any sense. Okay. How about these? So we have myelination in the central and peripheral nervous system. They're similar in that they have myelin, but there are differences. What are some of the differences that we see? In central and peripheral mile. Storm. The difference between the peak and the edge. Nice. Tell me about that. So, in the central nervous system, they have a readenticate. Okay, great. Yeah. And in the peripheral nervous system, it's the schwannicles. Okay. Oligodendrocytes in the CNS, Schwann cells in the PNS. How about the myelin itself? Okay, why does that make sense? <laughs> true and true. True, exactly. So, what's our protection for the central nervous system? Excellent. We have a hard outer covering. 
this is great because you can bump that and you're not going to hit your nervous system. It's bad though because it defines the volume. There's only so much space we can fit in there. You have to have compact myelin, but that works because we have that skull. So they work together. <clears throat> and myelination still saves space. You'd have to have massive axons to conduct as quickly as a myelinated axon. And it's fluffy out there in the peripheral nervous system because our nerves are exposed essentially there. They don't have a bony covering. And sometimes they do still get injured. And the first thing to get injured is the myelin. You get demyelination, so you have transient neurological symptoms, but they'll resolve. You don't have complete recovery. <clears throat> now the myelin also has different proteins in it that not only affect how compact or fluffy it is, but it affects the ability for axons to grow. Which one of these myelin are going to be permissive to axon? Regrowth. Permissiveness means you're encouraging it. You allow it. Okay. You're permitted. I think it's yes. Yeah. You ever hear of spinal cord injuries? Great. How well do those heal? Excellent. Central or peripheral nervous system when we're dealing with spinal cord. Excellent. Central nervous system and all good intersites do indeed have proteins that prevent the regrowth of axons. We don't want to rearrange our central nervous system once we put it together. It's fairly complicated and we've modified it over the years. We got it just how we want it. Let's not go changing things. So all the dendrocytes are going to make a myelin that's compact and prevents the outgrowth of new axons. You can get local branching, but you're not going to get long distance axons. Yet. They don't allow it. But peripheral nerves, totally fine. What the hell is a microglia? Excellent. Excellent. What's a macrophage? What are we thinking with that? Perfect. Yes. So this is our endogenous immune system. Because we have a blood-brain barrier, we tend not to pull blood cells into the central nervous system unless things are really bad. You need profound inflammation for that to occur. Most things are going to be handled by microglia. So whenever we have a little pruning of cell debris, they can handle that. All right, TBOA. This is a glutamate transporter inhibitor. This is going to block glutamate transporters. So here we're, we're looking at uh, extracellular glutamate levels over time. And now we've applied our TBOA. What's going to happen to our extracellular glutamate levels that we're, we're recording here? You say increase? Why do you say that? Great. So what is the purpose of glutamate transporters? Okay, so if we're taking it out of the astrocyte, where's it going? So here's my astrocyte. And you're saying that our Let's say our, here's our amino acid transporter. So here's our glutamate transporter. Excitatory amino acid transporter. Which way is glutamate moving? Into the cell or out of the cell? That's the astrocyte. Yeah, here's my astrocyte. Let's say I spit out some glutamate. What's the purpose of these things? These glutamate transporters. To take that glutamate in. Nice, to take it in. Why do we need to do that? So glutamate um, disrupts the frequency and makes it go lower. Um, so sometimes we do like What's going lower? The, um, the signal frequency. Okay. Lower or higher? There we go. Higher. 
We would have made it excitatory or inhibitory. Say it with some confidence. <laughs> exactly, it's an excitatory amino acid. It's right here. The answer is right there. You can't cheat. I've got an exam. It's excitatory, so we're going to increase the frequency of firing if glutamate's around. That's the problem. Have you all heard of this term? Cytotoxicity. Tell me about it. Great. So we're going to prevent excitotoxicity by cleaning up the glutamate. And excitotoxicity is exactly what it sounds like. It's toxicity or cell damage as a result of excitation. <clears throat> I think we'll get into this in lecture five, but just as a coming attractions, every time you move um, ions down their concentration gradient, you got to pump them back. Pumping costs ATP. Every time you make ATP, you run the risk of creating free radicals. So those electrons that are moving through the electron transport chain in the mitochondria don't always make it onto their target. Sometimes they escape and create superoxides, and those can then donate the electrons to other macromolecules like proteins, lipids, or DNA. So we can start to mutate the cell, we can damage its membrane, that's never a good thing. Also, when you move ions, you move water. Water's gonna follow, so you can get cell swelling and bursting, so you can get necrosis, or you can get apoptosis because of oxidative damage. That's what's going on with excitotoxicity. Very quickly, they can balloon up and burst. In the long run, they can get a shitload of mutations and die. We want to prevent that with excitatory amino acid transporters. And so when we block them, like you said, there's going to be an increase in glutamate concentrations. Dose dependent increase, as you can see there. So that they're applying different concentrations of TBOA, and we can see an increase in extracellular glutamate levels. So if this were an exam question, I would ask you to tell me what's going on here. What do you think the function of TBOA is? They'll tell you in the paper, of course, and you can Google it. That's totally fine. <clears throat> would this be a good thing or a bad thing to the cell? Why? I'd give you some leading questions and have you answer those. And hopefully you bring up some about the toxicity and whatnot. Okay, any questions on this? Cool. So we got myelinating glia, we got the microglia, those are gonna be our immune system. We got astrocytes, they do a whole bunch of things. One of the most important things that they do is keep neurons alive. There are many ways they do that, and one of them is removing neurotransmitters to prevent excitotoxicity. Maybe you remember something about extrasynaptic receptors. I might have mentioned that. Okay. BBB. Thank you. I would have accepted Better Business Bureau <laughs> briefly, and then we would have gotten to that. So, what is the blood brain barrier? What makes it up? Between? Nice. Tight junctions. So, unlike other uh, capillary beds that you'll find in your body, which are kind of loose to allow transfer, we don't see that in the central nervous system. Tight junctions all the way. There are only a few spots where we have leaky blood brain barriers, and that's when we can monitor the blood. We can vomit if we need to, and we can you know, keep an eye on whether we need to scream. So, there's a few places where we're going to allow access to the blood, but they are very discrete locations. Most of your capillaries are going to have a blood-brain barrier in it, and that's just the tight junction between vascular epithelial cells. We're keeping stuff out. How do we get stuff in? I'm going to jump down. So the tight junctions keep stuff out. We want to keep everything out. How do you know? What might we want to bring in? Okay, great. Okay. Not blood. Not blood. Maybe ethanol. Okay. 
<clears throat> sure. So there's some things that we do want to get through. Oxygen, glucose, very important. Glucose is the principal energy source for the brain. We're on that in lecture five. But it can't cross the blood-brain barrier. It dissolves in water pretty well, and it's not tiny. How do we get it across? One more time for me. Nice. Glute. Glucose transporters. Yeah, and we have a few different kinds. Are they exactly what they sound like? Yes. They are proteins that transport glucose. That's their job. So we'll take it from the blood into the astrocyte, from the astrocyte into the nerve. If we don't have these transporters, glucose can't cross because of those tight junctions and the fact that it's hydrophilic. It can't move through the phospholipid bilayer to use a key word we've all been reminded of. So what happens if we disrupt the blood-brain barrier? Why is that so bad? Okay, so free radicals, reactive oxygen species, same thing. They're going to contribute to excitotoxicity. So anything with <clears throat> some unpaired electrons. Free radicals. So first of all, you could have some uh, bacterium enter. That's possible. What you will have enter would be blood cells. White blood cell entry, not ideal, uh, but usually better than the other option of not having because you're bringing it in because of, let's say, infection, widespread infection. Red blood cells, never a good idea to bring in. They're not going to do anything other than sit there and get broken down. They're going to get broken down into heme, which is free radical, and it's going to damage neurons. It will lead to oxidative damage. You don't want blood in the brain. Blood is toxic to neurons. You have the breakdown product. It's going to kill them. So we don't want to disrupt our blood-brain barrier. That's the moral of the story. This is very useful. Keep blood out of the brain if blood is toxic to neurons. It's another reason why we have a middleman between neuron and blood supply. We have those, what do we call the processes from astrocytes that surround blood vessels? Thank you. Yes, and put processes. Those are going to surround the blood vessels. They're going to, of course, communicate with the blood, help regulate its diameter, but they're also going to help maintain those tight junctions as well and keep the blood brain barrier nice and tight, even in our old age. All righty, so we got a figure here. We got a few different molecules. Which one of these are going to freely diffuse across the blood brain barrier? A and B. Nice. Oxygen. This is certainly going to be nonpolar. There's no reason for those electrons to be distributed in any one location more than the other. Same thing here. Small, nonpolar, easily move across cell membranes. Hopefully, you've heard of O2 and CO2. If not, there they are. Breathe in, breathe out. How about this last one? Um, it's kind of big. So, hydrophilic. Nice. Definitely going to be hydrophilic here. Oxygen is more electronegative than those carbons. It's going to pull the electrons over. We're going to have options for hydrogen bonding, and that's going to prevent us from moving across and through membranes. Okay, you got the point there. One last one. By that, I mean three last ones. So we've talked about this already. This was on the quiz. What are some ways that we look at the different types of gamma-ergic interneurons, or really any neuron? What are some things we look for? Create different classes of inhibitory interneurons. Okay, of? Um, Signal filtration. Okay, action potential. 
Yeah, nice. So what are some options that we might have? What are some different firing patterns? Um, Sure. Are they always regular? Yeah. Great. We can have, what, what do we call like a, what, what would we call these? Thank you. Thank you. Bursting and pausing. That comes up. Sometimes you'll see it steady. Oh, nice. What do we call this? Uh, <laughs> Great, yeah, nice. <clears throat> Time's up. Yeah, or accommodating. Yeah, either one. I just think it's going to change over time. So it starts off really strong and then it slows down its firing rate, even though the same amount of stimulation is being applied. So here, what we're going to see is kind of the relaxing of ion channels and the, the increase in um, potassium conductance. So they're going to have potassium channels that are kind of slowly activating um, to slow down the firing rate there. So they're a little less excited. So we can look at firing rate. What else do we look at? We're talking about different types of interneurons. Um, Great. Yeah. So what genes do they express, for example? And we'll usually look at functional genes, like calcium binding proteins, different uh, neurotransmitters they could release, like neuropeptides, hormones, things like that. So we'll, we'll look at different markers. So we could characterize them based on what does it look like when we excite them? How do they fire? What's their activity pattern? What sort of genes do they express? We'll also look at what cells do they target? And look at the embryonic morphology as well. So there's a few options there. Basically, what's it look like? How does it behave? It's kind of like how we uh, characterize people too. All right, and we got a figure over here. We've got ourselves a pacemaking neuron. What does it mean to pacemake? Fire action potential. We'll get that that into your your car lot. Isn't it So they can increase and decrease. What they do for themselves is try to provide steady, constant firing of action potentials without any input necessary. So they have pacemaker pacemaker currents that are going to bring them above threshold automatically. And these are going to be stimulated by the after hyperpolarization. We'll talk about those later on. Um, it's also called H current because hyperpolarization stimulates it. So every time they fire their action potential and have that after hyperpolarization, that drives depolarization to the next. After hyperpolarization drives depolarization. So they have barely steady firing. All right, so we have two GABAergic interneurons. And let's say that we stimulate the red one. How do we expect this pattern to change? Would we see a consistent increase across that whole trace? Would we see a decrease in the frequency? Would it be stronger at the beginning or the end? What do you think? Yep. You got it. So these are both GABAergic interneurons right here. So they're going to inhibit every time they fuck. Every time they fire an action potential. Very good. So here, here's your stimulation right here. So you deliver square wave of current. Boom. It comes up. This is a non-adapting neuron. So it's fairly steady. And then you turn your current off. While you're delivering current here, what happens at every one of these spikes? Every time it's firing an action potential, what's happening right here? Thank you. We're releasing neurotransmitter and GABA. Is that going to increase or decrease the frequency of firing? What's that? Decrease. Very good. It's inhibitory. 
A neuron only matters when it's communicating, and this is how it communicates. We're trying to inhibit that with GABA, so we're going to decrease the frequency. Is that going to be a steady decrease? Don't fight it. There you go. Yeah, it's going to be steady. That GABA delivery is going to match this pattern. You've heard of frequency encoding? All or none. Okay, great, great. How about this one? Let's say we stimulate this orange neuron. What's this pattern going to look like? Are we going to see a steady decrease in the pacemaking, or is it going to be more inhibited at the beginning, more inhibited at the end? Fantastic. That's what we're looking at here. That's the concept, frequency encoding. The higher the frequency, the greater the amount of neurotransmitter, the greater the effect. So we should actually see this one be accommodating where it increases its firing rate over time. So there'd be a strong inhibition and then the firing rate will increase slowly as this one drops. So because we have interneurons with so many different firing patterns, those different interneurons can have different effects on their targets. So you can cause a fairly steady inhibition or you can cause an inhibition that's strong at the beginning. A week later, you can cause bursts of inhibition. There are options because we have such a great variety of interneurons. And this one uh, doesn't really matter, but uh, something to think about. You feel bad when you feel bugged. I got a no, I got two no's. I got three or four. You don't have to follow the crowd. You can have a heart. They don't feel bad. They don't really have a brain. So, I mean, who gives a shit? Kill them all. <laughs> All right, anything else before we get out of here? Okay, so on Tuesday, we'll be back here at a different time. Um, if you can't make it, we'll have all this Zoom stuff going, unless I forget. Um, who is going to be here on Tuesday? Great. Somebody tell me to make sure that I've started the Zoom recording. I was going to say something beginning, because if we're doing this, and then Going, it, it should be. Yeah, it totally should be. Way. You should tell me. Uh, I'll probably make some mistakes here and there. Uh, so don't feel bad about calling me out on it. So lecture two on Tuesday. Same thing as lecture one. I'll go talk to a camera uh, later and upload a video. There's my notes. There's a quiz. Fill out the quiz so you feel ready for class. If you have questions, put them in the questions box. This way they'll live on the website. Your question and the answer. Do we have anything to do between here and that next class besides like read and do a quiz? No, that's it. That's all it's ever going to be. Do I need to go on my